Hello, my name is uh, Petra Lewis, and this is just a very brief guide on how to make your slides more brain friendly. So take one of the talks that you've done previously that perhaps you've not really been as happy with or wasn't received as well as you thought it would be and go through these steps one by one and see what you can do. The overall intent of this is by improving how you deliver the information to your learners that they will learn more. In the end, the most the important consequence is not what you've said to them or what you've put on your slides and you feel you've delivered to them, is what have they actually learned from that information that you've delivered. Step one, simplify the fonts, the colors, and the backgrounds as much as you possibly can. You know, my phrase I like to say is that slide design is like men's trousers and memorability is very, very, really good. So if somebody comes out of your talks and they remember what your slide design's like, that's usually not because it was a good design. If they're focused on your design, they're not really listening to what you're saying. The key is the more readable and easily understandable you make your slides, the better people are going to learn from them. So a slide like this is less likely to have you focusing on whatever it is they're trying to teach than looking and wondering, you know, what are these little jumpy creatures here? What do, what do I do to uh, get the prize here? Wow, four different fonts, five different colors. Just keep it simple. Fancy fonts, you know, they might look pretty, but they really don't improve learning. You may have heard of serif fonts versus sans serif. Uh, serifs are these little tails on letters. A typical one is Times Roman. Um, Times Roman was developed for the Times newspaper in London. It's a very readable font in print, but when you're projecting something on a slide, a sans serif font is clearer. There's many of them around, Ariel, Helvetica, and so on. As much as you can, try and standardize the fonts that you're using throughout the slides and the layout so that people always look for the important information in the same place. Our eye gets very rapidly used to how somebody is presenting the information and if you keep changing it from slide to slide it just adds an extra level of a sort of cognitive challenge to people for understanding it. If you want to emphasize something you can bold it, you can italic it or you know maybe use one additional color. Capitals are interpreted as shouting. If you have to sit and listen to a talk which is completely in capitals, you have a headache by the end. It's as if somebody's been yelling at you for the last hour. And it's the same as capitals in emails. Um, they're considered rude, they're considered shouting, so don't do your talks like that. Your color contrast needs to be clear. It needs to be clear regardless of the lighting in the room. So this is uh, taken by a colleague, Eric Stern, at a um, talk at RSNA, and this is not a good color. Red, generally speaking, for text, doesn't appear very well, even if it's on a black background such as this. Be extremely judicious with your use of animations. They can be horribly distracting, and uh, if used too much, can be extremely irritating. So animations um, can be bad. This particular slide uh, contained a total of 73 separate animations and it was one of 82 slides in a talk that contained a um, similar number of animations. Not surprisingly, the medical students found this to be extreme cognitive overload. There are times, however, when the very selective use of um, animations can be helpful, such as putting arrows on objects. Um, however, never use a slide transition. They can be extremely painful and get very irritating to the audience after the first one or two. Think about how easy it's going to be able to read from the back of the room. Um, this large text here is in 54 font and I think everybody can see that now however far back they are, but can you seriously read this in 24 font from the back of the room and how about in 18 font? And part of the problem is that we usually sit about 20, 30 centimeters in front of our computers, and however small the font is, we can read that just fine. Unfortunately, our lecture rooms may be like this, or even bigger. And guess where our residents sit? Right in the back. So they're not necessarily going to be able to see those little letters that you've written, and our residents are mostly under the age of 30, so if you have people who are in their 50s and 60s, it's obviously gonna be a little bit more challenging. 
and this is part of why screenshots rarely work to put into a lecture. Um, when you do a screen capture, this font is going to end up about um, eight font size. We've already said that anything below about 30, 36 starts to get too small, so eight font is clearly too small. If you, if you really want to use a screenshot, then take it, crop it down, and mag up each section that you really want people to focus on. So here is row two of the Ariel Lecture Theatre at the RSNA, which I think holds about 1,500 people or something. And I can't read that text from row two. Here is the back row of the Ariel Lecture Theatre. Uh, nice big text, easily readable by everybody in the audience. Or if they can't read it, they probably shouldn't be radiologists. Think about how it's going to project. Should you have a light background with dark letters, or should you have a dark background with light images? light letters, and some of this is going to depend on whether you're including images in your talk or not. Obviously, as radiologists, we're usually including images. So in a bright room, this is great. You know, if you have a very um, light room you ha that can't have curtains closed, then you're going to be able to see this however bright it is. However, in a dark room, generally speaking, it's better to have light letters against a dark background. Your pupils are going to be dilated in a dark room, and that's going to produce less and what you really don't want to do is go light, dark, light, dark, because that's going to have the effect on people's eyes, so their pupils dilating, constricting, dilating, constricting, and it's going to cause a lot of eye strain and probably a headache by the end of the session. So images, you want people's pupils to be nice and dilated, that's why we read images in dark rooms, so don't put them against a light background. Look at this uh, cardiac MR, how much it looks, when you have a dark background, so you can really see the detail on the image. Step two, put every image and every graph on a separate slide in your presentation, wherever possible. A slide like this, which has you know, four images, a paragraph of text, or something rather sitting in here, lots and lots of different colors, even with each image, there's text that's upside down, for example, just to throw you a little bit more information you need to read, information you don't need to read, way too much on this slide way too much cognitive overload. Nobody knows what they need to look at for the amount of time that slide is likely to be up. Same again with this one. You know, we have 10 graphs and 12 black and white figures and two color figures here. You know, who knows what to look at? You know, you're probably not looking at whatever the guy's talking about. So you've got two different sources of information going into your brain um, when you put up a slide like this. One graph. It's obvious, it's clear, the lecturer can speak about it, it's even nicely color-coded, you know, pink for girls, yada yada. Um, very simple. Use all the screen real estate that you have. Don't put a small image in the middle of a big slide. You've wasted all of this screen real estate here. You've also got a lot of bits on here that you really don't necessarily need to show this uh, renal tumor crop down and then blow things up as much as possible. Give the guy who's sitting at the back of that lecture theatre as much opportunity to see the abnormality as the person on the front row. You know, there are times when you may want to include for um, more than one image, you're showing different sequences and you want people to be directly compare them, but you don't need to have as many as this on here. So this slide, which had a total of eight images of normal and abnormal lymph nodes in multiple different sequences. This could easily be picked up. So you could talk about the different sequences of normal nodes first, two on each slide, and then you could go on and talk about the abnormal slides, the abnormal nodes. Summarize your tables. How if you ever put a table up and immediately say to the audience, well, I know you can't see this, or you don't need to be able to read this, just stop yourself, right? If they can't see it, or they don't need to read it, then why are you putting it up there in the first place? Classic example from a slide I've seen many times at my institution, the Strategic Operations Plan, unreadable. Nobody can read any of this, so, you know, unless you're putting it up to say, hey, we have a strategic operations plan, there is no point doing this. Everybody's brain goes into case space the moment you show a table like this. Or like this, another classic from my medical school. You know, you can't read any of this stuff here, so why put it up? 
If all you want is to show this, then just put that on the slide. Even a table like this, which apart from the somewhat gruesome color combinations, is, you know, not that bad. I've seen a heck of a lot worse at many, many um, scientific sessions. Still has a lot of information on which, while it should go into a paper, doesn't have to go into the talk about that study. The information on that table that was really key to present to the audience could be summarized easily on this table. And if you notice here, I've also just highlighted and therefore signaled the important information that I really want to focus the audience's attention on. Step four, reduce the amount of text you're, you're presenting all together in your talk and also how much you put on any one slide. Don't forget, these slides don't cost anything and it won't take you any longer to split the information on one slide into two, three, or sometimes even four slides than it does to try and present that information when you cram it onto one. This is not a helpful slide. Maybe it's helpful if you give it as a handout, but it's certainly not when given in a talk. So what was the information that the presenter really wanted to convey from this slide? It was this. You know, this is easy, you can talk about it. You don't need every word that you're going to say sitting there on the slide. One way to really prevent yourself from trying to put too much text on a slide is to use 40 font. 40 font is my standard font. I sometimes will go down as low as 36 for slides. Um, and you just can't put very much on in 40 font. So it's going to tell you when you need to break that text and put it onto another slide. You don't need to put every word down. You just need to put the key information that you want people to remember and the rest of it they're going to hear from you. Sometimes if I want to use the same um, set of PowerPoint slides as a handout, I will put the additional information in the slide notes um, and then they can have that to read if they want to. Each slide should have no more than one learning point. Get them to focus on that learning point, consolidate all the information about it before you move on to the, your next learning or teaching point. So let's take a very typical and not that horrendous slide that you might use for medical students. Now if you look at this, you might think that you're just talking about this might all be one topic and one learning point, but there actually aren't. When you start to break it down, first of all you're going to talk about the mass effect on the brain. Then you're going to talk about how blood changes with time from being very dense to less dense to hypodense. And then talk about the typical shapes of a subdural hematoma. And then you're talking about the typical appearance of an epidural hematoma. In this way, you're allowing the learner to absorb the information about each specific topic before you move on to the next. And you are chunking the information together. Chunking information together is part of how we learn. And, it, and it, you are putting it in a form which they're going to find the most easy to memorize rather than trying to put multiple points on one slide. Step six, remove the abbreviations and the, acron the acronyms wherever possible. You know, aside from extremely common ones, CT, MRI, US for ultrasound, or um, CHF, for example, while we may think that these are very commonly used and everyone's going to know what they are, they are not necessarily. And there's nothing more frustrating than being in the audience and not wanting to say, you know, could you tell me what PIP2 means because I don't understand. So they're going to spend a lot of time trying to decode your, anacrim your acronyms rather than actually listening to your talk signal the key information. Remember like I did on that table back there, this is going to increase the retention of information and decrease the cognitive load because it's going to help them with note taking. This is a study where the students were given two lectures. In one lecture the key information was signaled. How do you signal? You say, this is the most important thing that you need to remember. This is key. If you don't remember anything else, remember this point. If you don't do this, the patient's going to die. If you don't see this, this is going to lead to serious morbidity and mortality for the patient. That's signaling. And that tells them what's the really important stuff that they need to get in. So in the signaled lecture, the students who took notes here 
did much better in their exam than the students who didn't take notes. In the unsignaled lecture, where the students who took notes were frantically trying to sort out the information, they're hearing one thing, writing something else because they're writing it from the last slide, they're trying to remember what was on the last slide because you've gone on to the next slide. These students who took notes actually did worse in the exam. Taking notes is as cognitively challenging as playing chess. So in this table, this was the key figure. This is a signaled, uh, this is signaled information on this particular table. It's usually very easy to do. Replace some of the text with images. Remember that modality effect. If you're presenting information in a visual form while talking about it, people learn extremely well, much better than if they've got text that they're reading and they're hearing about it at the same time. You know, do you need to have text to teach this? We're radiologists. There are so many times when we can just show an image and talk about the image rather than doing realms of text describing what's on that image. But even of outside of radiology, you know, often an image is much more memorable and much more impactful. Practice verbally. And I can't reinforce that strongly enough. I give a lot of talks but they're never right if I haven't practiced verbally a couple of times. You know, practice to the dog. Practice to your kids. My kids won't listen any longer. Or talk to a chair. It's not until you go through your slide verbally for the first time that you really see how the flow of it's going and what's comprehensible and what isn't. And you almost always go back and change some slides. Well, that's it. Um, that's just the real short version of how you should go through a talk you've already got or one you're about to give and uh, hopefully make it more brain friendly for your learners. Thank you for listening.